Welcome back. Cardiac Medications, Part 5. And I promise this is the last one. For this one, we're going to look at coagulation. Um, not as much coagulation disorders as medications that target coagulation. And we're going to talk with a little hemostasis review. Uh, complex process, and it does involve multiple steps. Uh, I took an advanced farm or advanced patho class once, and the first essay question on the first test was describe the coagulation pathway. And I kind of froze up because there are multiple steps. A lot of enzymes and clotting factors, and the final pro product is a fibrin clot that keeps you from losing blood. So it's not just about the platelets, there's a lot of other things that go into it. Generally, with the clotting process, you start with some sort of injury, which causes a vessel spasm, also known as constriction. Platelets become attached to, or attracted to, and they adhere to an injured area. So as these platelets all stick together, they form a plug. Okay, so the, the platelets kind of start the whole process, but the true stable clot is actually a combination of fibrin strands, coag factors, all those things. Usually, normal clotting occurs in about six minutes. There's two different pathways that can lead to a clotting clot. They call it the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. And it involves multiple factors. The liver produces all of your clotting factors except for one von Willebrand's factors. So you need to think about that when someone has liver involvement secondary to an oncologic reason or secondary to heavy alcohol use, that they're going to have problems with clotting. So injured cells are going to release a substance called prothrombin activator. Prothrombin activator changes prothrombin to thrombin. Calcium plays a huge role in clotting and it's in multiple steps of the clotting cascade. Thrombin changes from fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin forms that insoluble web over the injured area to stop your blood flow. Categories of meds. There's basically three for coagulation. Antiplatelet aggregates, anticoagulants, and thrombolytics. And like I mentioned before, it's important to differentiate. Uh, a lot of times you want to put everything into the anticoagulant category. That's not correct. So from here on out, I want you to focus on being accurate when you're naming your medications. Okay. Antiplatelet drugs, their job is to alter the plasma membrane of platelets so that they cannot aggregate. So basically, it keeps them from sticking to one another. The primary use is to prevent thromboformation after a stroke or an MI. As you know, some antiplatelet drugs are used after a stent placement. One of the biggest effects is abnormal bleeding. You have to watch for GI bleeding, increased menstrual bleeding, and all the, t the teaching that goes along with bleeding precautions like using electric razor, watching for changes in mental status, holding pressure for longer periods of time. And two example medications of an antiplatelet aggregate are aspirin and clopidogrel, which is also known as Plavix. The anticoagulants are not necessarily blood thinners. It's kind of a misnomer. They don't change the thickness of the blood. They prevent formation of clots. So these blood thinners, or not blood thinners, these anticoagulants are going to inhibit specific clotting factors in the cascade, and it's going to decrease how well the platelets are going to stick together. It's going to increase the time it takes to form clots and lengthen your clotting times. And your two prototype drugs are heparin and warfarin. It's important to know the antidotes. These are one of those medications that the antidotes is, are very important. And the heparin antidote is protamine sulfate. And the Coumadin antidote is vitamin K or phytonadione, something like that. Other things to consider when you have patients on medications is what do you monitor? And for patients that are on anticoagulants, there are specific prompt parameters that you need to monitor. Uh, for Coumadin, you have your PT and your INR. A normal PT is 10 to 13. Okay? On Coumadin, you're looking to have one and a half to two times normal, both on 
your PT, and then in your INR, two to three times normal. So those are usually the targets in terms of planning an INR. An INR of one is a normal thing, but if someone's on Coumadin, the expectation is the INR will be two point, between two and five, or two and three, 2.0 to 3.0. The partial thromboplastin time, also known as the activated PTT or the APTT, is what is used to monitor heparin therapy. And on heparin, generally therapeutic is considered 50 to 80 seconds. Some sources or some institutions will have 60 to 80 seconds as being the target for therapeutic dosages. Heparin is usually adjusted if it's given an IV form on a sliding scale such that you can maintain or get to a level that's going to keep you in that therapeutic range. Post-MI, you may see thrombolytics or revascularization used. It's possible that someone may go on to a heparin drip and possible conversion to Coumadin. If somebody has a pulmonary embolus, you're going to see someone using heparin or Lovenox and con conversion to Coumadin. Heparin makes great math problems. So if you have 25,000 units of heparin in 250 milliliters of a solution, first thing you need to think about is what is the concentration? How many units per milliliter? Once you know that, you can easily figure out how many units are hanging or infusing if the client is receiving 12 milliliters per hour. So to determine concentration or units per milliliter, you take 25,000 divided by 250 and get a result of 100 units per milliliter. And then you take 12 milliliters per hour and multiply it by 100 units per milliliter to get an answer of 1,200 units per hour. For clients who are on bed rest, the focus is on DVT prophylaxis, and this is for the purpose of preventing DVT formation and preventing the risk of pulmonary emboli. So you'll see patients either on heparin, 5,000 units subcutaneously, given in the abdomen, or a low molecular weight heparin, which is also known as Lovenox. It's the same degree of anticoagulation, but it lasts a little bit longer and is a little bit more stable. So what they found with the Lovenox, or the low molecular weight heparin, is that it was a little bit easier to send patients home on that medication. And it's also given in a subcutaneous form. The link here showing to the YouTube video is actually looking at the procedure for giving sub-Q Lovenox. And anoxaparin is the other name for low molecular weight heparin. Most serious side effect of anticoagulants is bleeding. Also, you have to watch your platelet count with heparin. There's something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, or HIT. Sometimes you hear HAT, which is heparin-associated thrombocytopenia. And this is something that happens to some patients that are on heparin therapy, and it may necessitate them having their therapy discontinued. Monitor the neurologic status of your patient anytime their clotting is impaired because of the risk and the worry about brain bleeds. Heparin and low molecular weight heparin can be given to pregnant clients and I, I know of some friends who had some autoimmune clotting disorders who had to take Lovenox throughout their entire pregnancy. Monitor intake of vitamin K rich foods if on Coumadin. Limit intake of garlic. Generally what they'll say is to tell people to maintain a consistent intake of vitamin K rich foods and they'll adjust the INR based on that but not to change things too much. When you're caring for a patient on anticoagulant therapy, make sure that you know their complete history. Make sure that you've looked at their coag studies initially and also during through therapy. So if you receive a report that a patient is on a heparin drip, it is your responsibility to see what the last PTT was, if adjustments were made, if they're due for another one, or if you need to make an adjustment based upon it. Assess for therapeutic effect, and then also assess for any signs or symptoms of abnormal bleeding. Ideally, your goals are going to be a reduction in blood coagulation or understanding of patient teaching. 
and the implementation is to monitor the patient. Okay, encourage early ambulation to reduce the risk of blood clot formation. Tell the patient to stop smoking, because smoking is one thing that will greatly increase platelet aggregation. And monitor associated lab values, as well as a CPC for hemoglobin, hematocrit, and platelet count. That's all I have for this lecture. Thank you very much for your time, and good luck on learning your cardiac pharmacology.